Hi students, welcome to um, the week 4 material. We're going to go ahead and start out with chapter 13. Um, we're going to be talking about how populations evolve. Okay, we're going to jump right into the material here and um, basically elaborate some concepts that I introduced within the first lecture. In The Origin of Species, remember that was the book published in 1859 that was written by Charles Darwin. Darwin proposed a hypothesis, which is a scientific explanation for his observations. He described the evidence supporting his hypothesis, made testable predictions, and reported the results of numerous experiments he had performed. Darwin hypothesized that present-day species are the descendants of ancient ancestors, that they still resemble in some ways, and that change occurs as a result of a process in which um, generations beget generations that are modified in some way. So he called this descent with modification, and he proposed a mechanism that would explain how that descent with modification works, which is natural selection. Natural selection is a process in which organisms with certain inherited characteristics, so characteristics that have a genetic basis, are more likely to survive and reproduce than are individuals with other characteristics. As a result of natural selection, a population, which is a group of individuals of the same species living um, in the same place at the same time, changes over generations. So basically this just says that populations change over time due to varying selective pressures. So a population can be a group of animals, a group of plants, a group of bacteria. They just have to be the same species because if they're not the same species they're not going to be interbreeding and that is not going to affect natural selection. So they have to be the same species, they have to be the same at the same place because they're not going to encounter one another in order to interbreed if they're not at the same place. And of course they have to live in the same time period. So this is an example of a population, or what would probably be a subpopulation since they are pictured on a single leaf. Um, but these are um, insects of the order Homoptera, so they are commonly garden pests such as aphids and stink bugs. They have piercing mouth, mouth parts in which they um, drink various plant juices. So this would be an example of a population that would be affected by natural selection. So over generations there are going to be some individuals with certain heritable traits that basically end up doing better than other individuals in that population. So maybe they have a spot pattern that is particularly scary or toxic looking to birds. Um, they're particularly brightly colored, or they are better at finding mates, these particular individuals are going to be doing better in the department of survival and reproduction than their counterparts. Natural selection leads to evolution, which is defined as descent with modification, a genetic change in a population or species over generations, and the heritable changes that have produced the diversity of organisms we see on Earth. The first two are pretty intuitive to us. Um, we can definitely see that over generations things change. We can see that in our own um, family trees, and perhaps you have some distinctive physical characteristics that um, have been passed down from your parents or from your grandparents. So we can see that over time physical traits change, and there's also a genetic basis underlying those physical traits changing. So all of the characteristics that we have have a genetic basis. 
And in order for us to observe changes occurring over time, that means that there has to also be changes in the genetics of a population or species. The one that's sort of difficult to wrap your head around is this last statement here, which is the heritable changes that have produced the diversity of organisms we see on Earth. This is to say that the diversity of organisms we see on this planet today um, is the result of evolution, primarily by natural selection. And an example of um, two closely related animals that are well adapted to their environment due to evolution is this common iguana here and its marine iguana counterpart that lives on the Galapagos Islands. So these animals are going to have slightly different adaptations. Of course a land iguana is going to be better at climbing trees. It might have limbs that are slightly modified, slightly longer toes for example. It might have um, a slightly different tail shape that helps it maneuver up tree branches, whereas the marine iguana would need to have a more rudder-like tail. And it will probably also need to have adaptations for diving, such as an increased capacity of um, the red blood cells to carry oxygen, um, similar to what we see in whales. The origin of species was fundamentally different from the prevailing scientific and cultural views of Darwin's time. So what Darwin was proposing was fairly radical for the time period in which he lived. He was proposing that all of the diversity of life on Earth we see was not created in its current form, but rather evolved from common ancestry. So let's place Darwin's ideas in their historical context. The Greek philosopher Aristotle held the belief that species are fixed and do not evolve. And the Judeo-Christian culture fortified this idea. So they reinforced this idea um, with a literal interpretation of the biblical book of Genesis and the suggestion that Earth may only be 6,000 years old. Naturalists were grappling with the interpretation of fossils, which are imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past. So Darwin was born, incidentally, the same day that Abraham Lincoln was born, on February 12th, 1809. Um, however, he lived in Great Britain. And in December of 1831, as a young man, Darwin left Great Britain on the HMS Beagle, which is this ship here, on a five-year voyage around the world. And these uh, red arrows trace the path of the HMS Beagle. Uh, whoops. Of course, um, Darwin's most famous work occurred on these islands here, the, the Galapagos Islands. On his journey on the Beagle, Darwin collected thousands of specimens and observed various adaptations in organisms. And he was intrigued by the geographic distribution of organisms on the Galapagos Islands, as well as the similarities he saw between organisms in the Galapagos and those on the mainland in South America. Darwin was strongly influenced by the writings of geologist Charles Lyell. Lyell suggested the Earth is very old and was sculpted by gradual geological processes that continue today. So a few of those geologic processes would be um, erosion, which is apparent in these um, sandstone formations in eastern Montana, um, weathering by um, wind and water, this is a local picture, so some limestone here in Mammoth Cave National Park. Um, and you can see the forces of weathering on their shapes. And then when you see a stream bed, of course, the water has created a channel through that rock. So over thousands or millions of years, the water has worn away at the minerals of the rocks and created um, what we see today as a stream bed. Darwin reasoned that the extended time scale um, that was basically um, 
put forth by Charles Lyell. This extended time scale, meaning the very old age of the Earth. This would allow for gradual changes to occur, both in species and in geologic features. So if, in fact, the Earth was billions of years old instead of mere thousands, it is very reasonable to hypothesize that the diversity in life that we saw today and the structures that we see in geologic formations um, were not created in their current form, but were actually sculpted and remodeled over a very long period of time. So Darwin made two main points in his book. Um, one was that organisms inhabiting Earth today descended from ancestral species, and that natural selection is the mechanism for descent with modification. And this second one was really what placed Charles Darwin in a class of his own, because while other scientists had also proposed that Earth was actually old and that modern day species were descendants of ancient species, none of them had put nearly as much time and research into discovering what the mechanism to explain those phenomena would be. So he proposed that natural selection is this mechanism for descent with modification. Evolution leaves observable signs, and we will examine five of the many lines of evidence in support of evolution. These include the fossil record, biogeography, comparative anatomy, comparative embryology, and molecular biology. Fossils, of course, are imprints or remains of organisms that lived in the past, and they're often found in sedimentary rocks. So, of course, the lower layers of rocks were deposited in the ancient environment first, and then as time progressed, new sedimentary layers were laid down. So we can basically see a record of past life on Earth in these rock layers, and we can use dating methods to estimate the ages of these sedimentary layers. So um, the fossil record is a very robust line of evidence in support of evolution, and we see gradual change in some species, and we also see um, some species disappearing from the fossil record altogether. So certain species, of course, have gone extinct. The dinosaurs, all of the megafauna of North America, such as saber-toothed cats and woolly mammoths, those animals, perhaps unfortunately, have disappeared um, due to a changing environment and some believe early human hunters taking advantage of naive animal populations that were relatively easy to hunt. These are a few um, fossils that I have found. Um, these were in eastern Montana, and um, these are some turtle bones here, and then some ornamentation from fish. So the external structures near fish gills. And then this was a bone that I found, and I'm not entirely sure what species it is or even um, what group of animals it came from, so whether it was a mammal or something else. But as you can see, um, fossils are incredibly complex, and they, <clears throat> excuse me, they leave pretty amazing evidence behind. So a lot of the structures that were once part of living animals are still um, evident. So with this, we can see the matrix within this bone that used to hold the bone marrow. And as you go towards the outer edges of the bone, it gets denser. So we see a lot of conservation in structure. Um, however, it's important to keep in mind that the organic substances that once were in these bones have been replaced over geologic time with um, minerals. So this bone has become very hardened and um, different, fundamentally different than when it was actually a part of a living organism. Um, and this is a picture of a paleontologist with some students, and they're slowly unearthing um, a dinosaur skeleton. I'm going to go ahead and pause here and pick up in the next um, lecture segment.